This is Kandahar Air Base, the gateway to the war in Afghanistan. We live in a war zone here. The moment you step outside a wire, you are in the threat zone. There's one billion pounds of NATO hardware and 10,000 soldiers from around the world all inside the wire. But it's also a bustling community in the middle of the desert. I'd even recommend it to my mother. Complete with fast food joints, sports pitches, and even a couple of massage parlours. And it's the story of everyday life of the British men and women living here. Some nice men in there. <laughs> Can't help but look. The ones in the sky and those on the ground. It's nice here, but obviously when we go out on the ground, it's totally different. Afghanistan, one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Almost a thousand soldiers have died here since 2001. But inside Kandahar Airfield, it's a different world. And the man making sure everything runs like clockwork here is RAF Air Commodore Bob Judson. I am the mayor of the, of the town, if you like. I'm running the base as the base commander, and I'm the landlord for the real estate here. We've got every type of aircraft under the sun, from fast jets to doing the bombing roll out here, to unmanned air vehicles doing reconnaissance and also actually attack missions. We're running about 10,000 movements a month out of here. That, to put it in perspective, that's uh, about half of Gatwick Airport. The camp's built next door to Kandahar International Airport. Domestic Afghani planes share the runway with Chinooks and Hercules. But at the heart of the operation are the GR9 Harriers. They provide air support to the troops on the front line. Jet pilot Rich Hillard, also known as Bolly, is now on his fifth tour of duty in Afghanistan. This place has changed in the four years I've been coming here and it did start off as quite a bare base. We were living in tents, showering in tents, but you know now, other than being a long way away from home, it's pretty good. The airbase is getting ready for a top secret NATO operation. A convoy of 200 trucks are leaving the base and traveling 100 miles north through hostile territory to deliver a 200 ton turbine to the Kajaki Dam. It's known as a hearts and minds operation and it will bring electricity to 100,000 Afghan homes. To help the convoy out, Harrier pilot Bolly is going to take some reconnaissance photos of the route, so the trucks don't run into any surprises. Uh, Bottle of water in my little bag here just in case I get thirsty, and I've got uh, another uh, bag there in case I need the loo. Yeah. Hopefully just take a few photos and that'll be it. We don't really know what's going to happen. Um, we do a lot of planning beforehand, but often it's not, that's not actually what we end up doing. The Harrier GR9 jump jet is loaded with weaponry for every mission. And Bonnie's jet is carrying rockets and bombs weighing over 2,000 pounds. He's got two laser-guided paveway bombs that can wipe out whole compounds. He's also carrying 38 of the more versatile CRV-7 rockets, which travel four times faster than the speed of sound. The warheads can be released individually or all at once for a bigger impact. And if that wasn't enough, he's got two airburst bombs with a lethal radius the size of a football pitch. But the purpose of this mission is to take some photos. So under the fuselage is a stills camera. After taking a few photos, he gets a call from the troops on the ground. They're being attacked near Kajaki and want Bolly to find out where the rockets are coming from. Two miles out. 
Okay. He'll be screaming down the radio, there'll be bullets going on in the background and he'll be in a lot of trouble. And he's just trying to get across to me as quickly as possible where that threat's coming from. Bolly switches on a bit of kit that's revolutionised the way the war is fought in Afghanistan. It's called a sniper targeting pod, which is next to the steels camera under the fuselage. Its telescopic lens gives the pilots a detailed view of the ground, which is then beamed to the troops on the front line, giving the soldiers live bird's eye footage of the enemy. The army asks Bolly for a show of force. My aim is to provide the maximum noise on the ground to scare the guys away. I'm flying the jet down to 100 feet above the ground, going along at about 600 miles an hour, so I've got to look out for people potentially shooting at me. But probably the biggest thing I've got to look out for is the ground, because when you're going that fast, that low, it comes up to meet you pretty quickly. There's also lots of aerials in Afghanistan, and if you hit one of those, that would really spoil your day. So I've got to stay cool, really. At the sight of the jet, the Taliban make a run for it. And Bolly heads home to Kandahar, with his bombs all intact. Up next, some rookie recruits prepare to leave Britain to head into Afghanistan. It's going to be a hell of an experience. I'll tell you whether it's fun or not when I'm out there. Kandahar Airfield is a sitting target and it's down to the British RAF regiment to guard it. The moment they're outside the fence, there is a, a threat from mines, both uh, modern mines emplaced by the insurgents, and also legacy mines that have been there for years in this conflict-ravaged country. Every six months, a new squadron comes out to Kandahar to guard the base. The next batch are getting ready to leave RAF Honington in Suffolk. All right, lads, what's going to happen in a minute, right? You're going to get your final inspection from the corporals, all right? You should bring out your passport, your native travel order, and show your ID card as well. Send right, send right, Good. Before they go, Sergeant Bennett Jones is making sure his lads have got everything they need. Lads, get your dog tags out now so I can see them. ID card. Right, I didn't want any problems over the weekend that I need to sort out now before we f off. What? The what? Right, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> idiot. <laughs> right, take over. I'm pretty much their dad, and I think any dad would agree with me. Uh, having a child is very stressful. <laughs> All right. Um, now imagine having 30 kids to look after at once. So you can imagine what I'm going to be like sometimes. Out of 30 men, he's got 18 brand new recruits, and one of them is 21-year-old Nathan Chules. Never felt like this before. So I mean, it's a really weird feeling. Good feeling, though. So I mean, heart's going. Really looking forward to it. It's time to say goodbye. And for Jonesy, it means leaving his pregnant fiance, Lucy. It's just a bit nerve wracking now because I'm not going to see him until he gets back after the baby's born, so scary, I suppose. <laughs> There have been more than 100 British deaths in Afghanistan. So no one can be sure if they'll see their loved ones again. We'll be back before you know it, right? Have a lovely little daughter. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be crying in a minute. Yeah? All right? I love you. I love you. All right, come on. Get out of here now, right? So you don't see us go. <laughs> go. No, I'm going to wait with those. Go on. All right? I'll nice speak to you soon. But this is me now for six, seven months. Just deal with it, get over it. This is the real deal now. 
It's not no training. You need to start switching on. Next stop, Afghanistan. Four thousand miles away in Kandahar, Harrier pilot Bolly is bringing in his jet for some TLC. Hmm? What are you thinking? Uh, oh, the nose was sat quite high for some reason, so uh, let's try and work out why. Engineers like Jumper Collins and his team are the unsung heroes of the war because without them, the planes won't fly. I worked in a car garage for five years before I did this job and it's, uh, it's quite, quite a bit different. <laughs> Gave it a bit, of a bit of a bounce on landing, so well, not a bounce, but still. The engineers have eight Harriers to look after. If you lose an aircraft, go down to seven, there's a lot of pressure on you to get the aircraft up and running again, get back to eight. Um, the other day I think we dipped down to six and it was uh, quite hectic. Jumper's found a serious fault with Bolly's jet. Just here on the aircraft is where the fuel, forward fuel tank is, and we'd noticed fuel coming out down through that hole there. To get to the fuel leak, the engineers have got their work cut out. The Harrier's built around one central turbofan Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine. A nine and a half metre wing weighing two tonnes bolts on top. The leak is at the front of the fuel tank underneath the engine, and that means there's only one way to get to it. It's a wing off, engine out to find what's gone wrong. As surreal as it seems, Every Saturday, locals pour into the airbase and set up what's called the Jingly Market. They're looking for a special deal now if I go to the, uh, go to the same trader. The commander is a keen customer. For a lot of the people that are on the base who never get off, then this is the closest they will come to uh, you know, real locals. It's uh, one of the highlights of the week. There's obviously a great opportunity for us to come away with some good or bad souvenirs, and there's uh, both sorts available, that's for sure. Most Afghans live on around a dollar a day, so this is a nice little earner. But there's a trade-off. They have to go through a full search. Even the children. The worst sort of threat you can envisage here is a, uh, is a bomb. It's a busy market, there's lots of people inside, uh, both from us and obviously from the locals. So mitigating an explosive threat is probably the most important thing for us to do. Jackson's an interpreter, and today he's going to help NATO's commander with some bartering. Yeah, that's quite nice. It's a bit bright though, the colour's a bit bright. But it is a dangerous yeah. job. Yeah. The most of the time the interpreter or the guys who work for a net or ISAF, they get killed. I cover my face because I'm not sure, you know, who is Taleb and who is not. So if somebody recognizes me, of course they will kill me. How much for this? 250. 250. 100. 60, 60, 60. OK, 150. 220. No, 180. OK? Yeah. 180, done? Yeah. OK, here you go. Thank you, my friend. You. That's a big, solid chunk of stone. But Jackson, not his real name, of course, knows the commander's been ripped off good and proper. A hundred was good press. <laughs> I'm just generous. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Over on the runway, one squadron has just landed. At 2 a.m. in the 30-degree heat, they get their first look at Kandahar. They've been up for 24 hours. I don't actually feel like I'm here yet. It doesn't feel real at all. I can't wait to get sleep. I'm tired. Absolutely knackered. Welcome to Kandahar. The local time here is 0220. But it's not time for bed yet. There's the induction to get through first. 
most important, what to do in a rocket attack. You are to immediately lie face down on the ground. Further direction will be given by the movement staff. Some welcome speech. The regiment's used to roughing it in tents, so they're in for a nice surprise. This is the typical accommodation the lads will be staying in. Um, as you can see, it's, it is massively plush. Decent beds, decent lockers, you've got air conditioning. Um, you couldn't ask for more than this, basically. Bed at last, but not for Jonesy, and it's now 3 a.m. His keys are locked in his room. Okay. Well, these go dead. <laughs> With just three hours before they're on duty, this calls for lateral thinking. Mate, I'll smash the window in a minute. All it needs is a little gentle persuasion. It is now seven minutes past four in the morning. That's the sort of thing that happens, so the first night here is bound to happen. Uh, everyone's laughing now, as you see, everyone's just getting the rest down, uh, which I'm about to do now. So, uh, we'll see you later on. <laughs> First, a guided tour to help them get their bearings. If you look straight in front of you now, you're coming up to ECP3. That is your entry and exit to camp. To the right side, you've got the boardwalk, pizza rock, subway, Bird King burnt down a couple of months ago. <laughs> and Hoop Pond. The Poo Pond is the camp's biggest landmark a sewage works the size of nine Olympic swimming pools designed for 3,000 people. Now, it's struggling to cope with five times that number. You'll get used to that smell. You've got to turn the aircon off at night because it just sucks it all in. Anyone got any questions on a tour? We're about to we're here now. Where are we? <laughs> no, that's a question. <laughs> it's overwhelming for new recruits like Nathan Chules. It's huge. Absolutely massive. Really busy as well. So many people around this camp. Loads of different nationalities. Corporal Jim Davis wants to make sure they're ready to go on patrol for the very first time. You get everything that you are taking out on patrol with you. Everything. Pete, Pete, Pete. Right, fellas, two minutes then. He's going through their rucksacks to check they've got the right gear for going outside the wire. Get it, fellas, listen in then. Right, every bit of lot kit you haven't got, fellas, you're going down for 20. First off then, all of you, stick up your ID cards in your mitt. My wallet jump. 20, get on your arms. All right, I want to see your uh, rules of engagement cards. Then it's, it's not this soldier's day. OK, what I want to see now is I want to see your morphine and your first field dressings. Well, at least he's remembered one thing. Where is it, Robbo? Me and Ed will start at one end and we'll come down checking your personal kit now. The lads' packs weigh 55 pounds. Come on, Burnsy, hurry up. So they can't afford to take anything that's not strictly necessary. Honestly, going to wear that? Not the No. Take the smaller one. Look how much room it is compared to that. Yeah. Room's at a premium, you know that. Yeah, well, what is it with you with toothbrushes? I, one toothbrush. When's that from? It's going in the bin now, isn't it? Because it's minging. Have you smelt that? It's dry, crusted, it's horrible. Bin. Man. Three. Look how much smaller it is now. We're just lobbing out those false minging rags. Right, put it away.
Charles and his mates decide to treat themselves to a Kandahar luxury. And it's all there on the boardwalk. When you come back and you get to have a pizza up, it's brilliant. Um, it's, 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 it's open until like two in the morning, isn't it? Yeah. Two in the morning. Yeah. American football over there. Ice hockey going on over there. Oh, 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 ice. On the ice. <laughs> I expect it to be like just bog standard. But it's brilliant. It's like a summer camp. BFBS Radio, the strongest man in Kandahar competition, which has been held today, this afternoon. It's at the boardwalk, starts at two o'clock, and promises to be a great few hours of entertainment. Get yourself along. RAF fitness instructor Adam Hennessy wants to get all the nations competing together and take their minds off the war just for an afternoon. Quite excited about it, a little bit nervous, but um, everything seems to be coming together quite well at the moment. I mean, it's just coming up half past ten. Uh, got most of the uh, events set up, ready to go. I'd love to enter, but unfortunately, because it's my idea, I have to be the one to officiate it. Adams had to make do with what he can find around the base for props. He's managed to blag a spare tyre for the tyre flip. It is quite heavy. I'll probably guess around sort of 200 pounds. That is a, a plug from a bullet hole, so that's why we can have them. So, <laughs> authentic Afghan war tyres. One of the favourites to win the contest is Army Rehabilitation Trainer, Stricky. And he's just warming up. And that's it. <sighs> Being the winner in Kandahar, strongest man, like lightweight category, that's the one. It's all mine, I'll tell you. Show off. Kandahar's luxury compared to other camps like Bastion. It's got 80 shower blocks with hot and cold running water. All clean, with a little pair of towels, little... Uh, always stocked up on, on uh, toilet rolls, very clean and tidy. The guys in the field, I can, all, I can only apologise, they're just so lucky really. But yeah, everyone's got the job to do as falls. And mine is to get clean. Now, where's that soap? <laughs> Coming up, one squadron are going outside the wire. And the Brits take on the Canadians for the title of Kandahar's strongest man. Oh, Look at the size of him. <laughs> He's one big One squadron are going outside the wire. No, you've got to take your own kit, because it's all set out there definitely for you. Jonesy's got 18 brand new lads, and today they're testing his patience. Come on, lads, sort it out for sake. Give me that ear. Oh, right, word of warning, you don't walk around like that. Put it in your pocket. They've got to sort out the body armour, weapons and ammunition they'll need for the patrol. Once outside the wire, they could be gone for up to four days. Nervous, excited. Scared. They're checking over the battle-worn vehicles they've just inherited. But you can sort of see the dents on the sideways where they've been hit before. There's one wing that's been blown up twice already, and it just keeps getting fixed and sent back out. If I can just stick this sign back down. And there's other reminders of the realities of life in a war zone. It's basically telling the uh, locals to keep 100 metres away from us, because uh, the threat of suicide bombing out here at the moment. Happy with that? You ready? Yeah. Before they go, one for the album. You ready? Yeah. Nice one. Because it's like, can't wait to get out of there. And now it's here, it's like, whoa. <laughs> Going outside the wire. See a few of them a bit, you know, a bit nervous. You can see they're a bit anxious. But like I just said that, I asked them, you know, you all up for it, you all ready? And they're all yeah, too right. Let's get out there, let's do the business. 
The security of 10,000 troops and one billion pounds worth of military hardware is in the hands of one squadron for the next six months. Special top cover because we're one of the last wagons back. The men are travelling in a convoy of eight vehicles. There's one Vector that's a troop carrier, four Vixens that are lightly armoured Land Rovers, and protecting the convoy from the front, rear, and sides are three heavily armed Wimics or weapons mounted installation kits. Top covers provided by the rear gunner, operating a 50 caliber heavy machine gun, or HMG, which has the killing radius of 5 meters from over a mile away. This can be switched to a grenade machine gun that fires high explosive grenades at 340 rounds a minute. The Wimix commander sits in the passenger seat with a 7.62 millimeter general purpose machine gun. The convoy's biggest threat is going over roadside bombs, and they've come to their first vulnerable point, or VP. The squadron we took over from, yeah, they lost two lads around this area, so it's become a very important VP for us to make sure that we make sure that we do it properly. All clear. Then Wimmick Commander Jay Hudson spots something suspicious. Right, I just got a flash off a mirror to my one o'clock, it looked like a mirror flash. A local national in some ruins over there, blatantly holding a mirror above his head and flashing it to the sun. It's an insurgent way of communicating with each other, so we're, we're trying to get eyes on now, see what we can do about it to stop him. We, we call it getting dicked. Basically someone's signaling that um, they know what we're doing, basically. One of these could be a signal to actually start an ambush or start of an IED. Do you know what I mean? To signaling to someone that that convoy is in position and bang. Back at Kandahar Airfield, Harrier engineer Jumper and his team are finishing off fixing the fuel leak on Bolly's jet. Yep. There's no yeah, room for go. error. Well, everything these guys put their name to, they're responsible for. So if anything did go wrong, They've signed it. <laughs> they tethered the jet to the ground with chains so they can test the engine without it flying off. It's just really hot out here. I mean, it's about 37 degrees a day. This base plate, which we secure it onto, is boiling, been cooking in the sun all day, and now we're actually having to walk on it and work around it. And it's just really, really hot. Hopefully, um, well, it will pass its ground run first time. As the engine reaches full throttle, the chains have to withstand 22,000 pounds of thrust. So it's looking good, no leaks. Uh, all the figures seem to be matching up what they should be, so uh, it's all going well. But the real test is how it performs in the sky. Bob is planning to take the jet to 40,000 feet. We've done all our checks. It's past the flying colours on the ground run, so uh, there's no reason why it should, it should have a problem out there. But it's not taking off. Four days of work for nothing. Line message. Yeah, aircraft 43 just uh, throttled up and throttled down on the runway. I think he's coming back in. But Jumper's just got the jitters. There's nothing wrong with the jet. Oh, he's just doing the slams over again, isn't he? 
Is he taxiing down to the end of the runway and then going to come back up the other way, is he? Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. Bolly goes for it. Come on, sir. Take it. Job done. Bolly's plane rejoins the squadron. The finishing touches are being made to the strongman course. Can you all aim me at the tents? 60 competitors are signed up. And one of them's Big Mac, an RAF truck driver. Mac's been training for the last month, carrying everything but the kitchen sink in 35 degree heat. I've decided to go jogging with my body armour. I was told by a friend if I wore the body armour, I'd lose a lot more water, so obviously I'd sweat more. I've got a rucksack on, I put 40 kilograms in it, and I'm running with that to try and build my leg muscles up, uh, trying to get myself a lot fitter than what I am. Under his harsh regime, he's managed to lose a stone in a month, but will it be enough to take the title? I'm not going to say I'm going to come top because there's some big lads out there competing, so I'm hoping to come in at least within the top ten. Liquid soap for washing machine. Liquid soap for washing, that's very uh, popular, and unfortunately it's a popular item we don't have. One of the eldest competitors is 48-year-old Alain Baudouin a civilian who runs the Canadian worst, corner shop. The worst case scenario is that you get a bar of soap, some hot water, and, and do it yourself. I've been training for the last two or three weeks, so I've been flipping tires and carrying dumbbells and doing everything that needs to be done to be able to compete. But um, hopefully we're all going to have fun in the spirit of friendship and, and uh, the reason why we're here, we're going to have a great time with that. Alain is seven weeks into a six-month break from his real job as a customs officer in Montreal. I thought it would be an interesting experience to come here and just be with his troops. Sometimes there's a level of comfort in knowing that the person that's actually serving you is somebody from your hometown. If they need a shoulder to cry on or somebody to talk to, um, we're all there for them. Over at the RAF regiment, Sean, one of their mechanics, is a late contender. I only entered the competition about an hour ago, so I've not really had long. Currently holding ammo boxes out at arm's length and training for the Kandahar Strongest Man. His odds are about as big as his biceps. I think I've been holding them uh, about a minute and a half. Yeah, slowly starting to hurt. Yes. It's 2 p.m. and strongman contestant Stricky's being weighed in. I need a nervous poo big time. Nervous pee? Mate, f it. Durham back. Well, you see, if this was baby blue and that had a bit of an eagle above it, oh, oh, it's yeah. Air Force PCI, you'd be able to breeze this. Loser. Hi, Strix. Have you seen my little fan base over there? And the Brits need all the support they can get, because Canadian Troy Goodfellow has just arrived. Look at the size of him. <laughs> He's one big <laughs> It's stiff competition, but Mac's not bothered. Yeah, there's some big guys here. They've obviously been training, taking a lot of supplements in as well. So have they got the strength there at the end of the day, or does it just look like they've got the strength there at the end of the day? Corner shop contestant Alain isn't so confident. Maybe a bit off more than I could chew, but we'll see. <laughs> hoping for the best. I was kind of hoping there'd be an over 45 club. Three, two, they're off on the first event, carrying 25 kilos of water in each hand. Late entrant Sean's feeling the strain. Oh, that's got to hurt. I slipped. <laughs> Wasn't the best tactics, to be honest. <laughs> Let's 
doing very well. It's the support, I reckon. Yeah. Getting him through it, <laughs> getting him through it. <laughs> Go on, then, guys, give him some support. Let's push him on. <laughs> but Troy's showing what he's made of. Pure brawn. Martino! Did it, man! Put the arms. <laughs> Couldn't straighten his arms. Uh, shouldn't have worn the gloves, because I had no grip whatsoever. Guys, can you That's my two worst events out of the way. I'll come back now and smash it, hopefully. Well, to be honest, I don't think anyone's thinking of the war at the minute. So I'm achieving my job. Go, Sean! For last place, it's a tug of war between Sean and 48 year old Alain. Good result. <laughs> Very good result. <laughs> No prizes for guessing the winner. Odds on favourite, Troy. UK guys, tough. And runner up, Stricky. <laughs>
but the reality of living in a war zone has hit home. The first Taliban attack on their squadron has shaken the young lads. All we're doing is just deterring them. We're not actually stopping them. We go through some villages on a normal patrol. There's low, hundreds of villages around the RAO. And some villages are cool. You, you go past the kids, they're all loving you and that. And you go through some villages and some of them just hate you. It's like, wh why? We're doing you a favour. They're hating us. Throwing rocks at us. If the, the, if the locals ain't appreciating what we're doing, how can you appreciate what you're doing in yourself, do you know what I mean? It's just a mixed barrel of feelings. It's weird. Kandahar Air Base offers a few surreal distractions to the war. And the Thai massage parlour is definitely one of them. This is all my girl over here. Um, and they're all from Thailand, so they know what they're doing. Toy and her team of six masseurs brought a touch of the Orient to the airbase two years ago. If you look at the outside and you're not the world, you can just walk in and you just forget where you are. The army's strongman runner-up Stricky is in need of some muscle relief. No better day to spend my Sunday morning getting a, a Thai massage, I think, so just just rub those aches and niggles out of my body. They don't do extras, I'm afraid. Well, so I've been told. I'll, I'll ask when it's my turn in a minute. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> but yeah, no, nah, I think, I think it, apparently if you ask, you get, you get or I'm not even going to attempt it. It's like ordering a Chinese. Could I have um, the deep tissue massage, please? I can't believe I'm on operational tour and again a tire massage and it's just it's amazing. It's just it's unbelievable. Charles and his mate Fergie have some downtime too. I don't trust myself getting a massage. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> don't ask. Yeah, don't ask. But something else has caught his eye. This is Burger King. Doesn't look like it's open. When do you open? Four days. Four days. We'll be off patrol in four days. And we'll be on leave. And we can come back and get a burger from Burger King. In Afghanistan, who would have thought it? <laughs> it's like a, two burgers, a load of chips, and then a little bit of lettuce on the side to make it feel better. Jonesy's just got mail from his fiance, who's expecting their first baby. A pair of socks. Uh, that there's the, the latest scan picture of my little girl. Uh, it's a bit hard to obviously make out, but you know she's there, and she's always pretty cool. <laughs> Next time. The camp gets camper. Woo, the things I do for charity. The Chinooks pick up casualties from the front line. And the regiment comes under attack again. But this time, it's serious. Four and a half tons of women that's been blown 15 feet to the side of the road. We have one man trapped underneath that vehicle at the moment. It makes you really angry. They're just cowards. And that next time is next Friday at 8. Coming next tonight, an undercover mission looks like it's about to fail and the cause seems transparent enough in NCIS.